me, it's the first time to be here, and after hearing all these talks in the morning, which are very broad, uh, I have to say, now you will get something which is very specific, and maybe a little bit too much of the physics, but there is a lunch break afterwards. <laughs> I can explain all your questions. Um, I called it exploration missions and radiation, because uh, that's actually a slide I draw a few years ago, and this is a kind of very um, US, Russian perspective of human spaceflight. Because at the time I did this slide 10 years ago, it was like, okay, there is the ISS, and then maybe we will fly to Mars. And now in the last 10, 10 years, there's a paradigm change. We have the private industry going to the International Space Station. We know that we are going uh, to cis lunar orbit, to the moon, and Mars is not so far away anymore. So this changed dramatically, in my opinion. And concerning the humans in space, and if this would be working, okay. So, concerning humans in space, currently we are at the space station. We know that we want to go back to the moon, and at a certain point of time, we also want to go back to Mars. Um, the problems we face, and that's something we will face for all human exploration missions, and that's something beyond life support and beyond the probability that the rocket is going to be launched safe. We have three main focuses if we want to send humans to space and bring them back safely. There is the microgravity environment, which is uh, related to the fact that there is bone loss on the weight-bearing structure, the brain functions are kind of disturbed, etc. There is the psychosocial issues, which have to be discussed in detail. What crew do you send? Uh, how long are they going to be there? If it's a flight to Mars, it's a three-year three mission. You have to have to tackle the problems of isolation, confinement, separation from Earth. As we saw this morning, this nice picture from Mars to Earth. Earth is very far away. It's not like that you open the door and then you're back home. Uh, and the third problem, which I'll go a little bit in more detail, is the radiation environment. And the radiation environment means we have to deal with effects which could lead for a long duration mission to possible cancer or an increase in cancer probability, which we have to tackle in ethical terms and also in terms of uh, giving guidelines of how to do this. And we have to deal with short-term effects uh, in terms of what happens when the sun sends out a solar particle event. And Bill Gerstner mentioned this in the morning. Uh, the problem with radiation is normally you cannot taste smell or see it, but in principle you can see it. If you look at this movie, that's actually uh, a movie of the sun taken in uh, September this year by the Soho Observatory. And if, if you look at the right part of the screen, you saw this big explosion. And then uh, a few minutes later, you see all these strange dots on the screen. And that's actually protons, so uh, very high energetic protons, interacting with your CCD screen. So in this sense, you can see the radiation impinging on you. And that's not only impinging on the satellite, that's impinging on astronauts who would be on the surface of Mars, or and even also on board the space station. So uh, what we can do, we can, of course, measure it. And uh, I'll show you just a few examples. Where do we measure different kinds of radiation? What does it mean for us? So uh, since I come from Cologne, uh, the first thing is like I have a radiation detector and I measure for 12 hours and I see this. So it's kind of background. That's the natural radioactivity which you have in the soil. It's something we cannot avoid. Uh, if you go to different parts of Europe, like in Finland, there is more radioactivity in the ground. So you see it already increased. If you fly an airplane, like this is a flight to Japan, you see that the radiation levels increase by flying in the airplane. And if you go to the space station, it looks very funny at once, these strange uh, features what you see, but that's in principle that the radiation follows the orbit of the space station, depending on how good your atmosphere shields you against the radiation. So it's there, we can measure it. Uh, the question is, where does it come from? especially when we go to Mars. Uh, I always like to show this slide here. It's so-called the space radiation environment. And the first main problem we face is the sun. And the sun, as, I just, uh, as we just saw before in this movie, um, can emit, when it's very active, uh, 
protons uh, with, with high energies in so-called solar particle events. And that's something which we have to deal with on a short-term scale. So that means a high amount of radiation is emitted in a very short amount of time. So you have to be able to cope with this. You have to be able to build spacecrafts which, are, which have probability or which have kind of storm shelter where the astronauts are protected. Because otherwise, they would get radiation sickness and possible the late cause would be death on a very short time frame. And the second uh, source of radiation is the so-called galactic cosmic radiation. This is, uh, they come from supernova explosion and they kind of give us like a cosmic background. So they are always there. If you fly to moon, to Mars, they are always there. And they are in principle the main concern for long-term effects of radiation, so for the induction of cancer. So we have to deal with them as well. And then uh, what we have on Earth, and that in principle helps us, so uh, lucky we have this, is uh, a magnetic field. And a magnetic field is, it shields against incoming radiation. So that's for us very good at the surface of Earth. But this magnetic field also leads uh, to the fact that particles are trapped in this magnetic field. On Mars, we don't have to care about this. There is no magnetic field, but also that means there is less shielding against radiation on the surface of Mars. So that means if we go for exploration mission beyond low Earth orbit, so beyond our current international space station, we have to deal with this background radiation environment from this galactic cosmic rays. We have to be able to cope with this, with the solar particle events, which in a short amount of time can deliver a very high amount of dose. So the exploration environment is much harsher, much harsher than we have currently on board the space station. So, of course, we have to measure it. So, uh, the idea already came 50 years ago, so that's actually quite a nice picture from the year 1964. So that was the first radiation detectors used in space during the uh, Mercury Atlas missions. Um, Actually, at this point in time, they were not concerned about the natural radiation environment. They were more concerned uh, about radiation because uh, there was the Starfish Prime nuclear bomb explosion in the atmosphere in 1962. So they were afraid that due to this explosion, they created artificially trapped radiation which could harm the astronauts. So that was actually the reason these radiation detectors were mounted uh, on, on the Mercury Atlas missions. Okay, what we do now on board the International Space Station. So what do we do to protect the astronauts, to care for the astronauts? Um, at one point in time, we have the astronauts up there. Now it's always a crew of six people. There will be more coming with uh, the crewed SpaceX and with the Boeing in the next years. So also the population on board the ISS will grow, but we'll have more and more astronauts going to cislunar orbit and to Mars. So what we do nominally, as a scientist, we put radiation detectors somewhere in the lab and we measure the radiation dose. So that's kind of what you would do also on ground in, in hospitals. That's kind of so-called area monitoring, what we do. And that's actually European radiation detectors, that's American radiation detectors. So it's all done in kind of an international community between all the international partners. And with this, you get kind of a radiation map inside the Columbus Laboratories. You know how much you would expect at different parts. Uh, what do we do for the astronauts? So if you are an astronaut, you're obliged to carry a radiation detector. This is a personal radiation detector. That's something you have to carry on your body, which measures the dose you receive during the mission. It goes into your medical records, and that gives you also a possible limitation for further missions. Uh, the picture below just shows uh, from left to right that uh, the Russian detectors, the US detectors, and the European detectors. In principle, they all have the same uh, measurement devices within there. They just look a little bit different. Um, problem is they are passive. So passive means you expose them, you have to bring them back. So for exploration mission, not a real good idea. So you have to do something new. Uh, what's currently done, also in terms of exploration, you go from these passive radiation detectors to active one. And that's actually a development we did with industry for ESA. That's a battery-powered radiation detector. So you can use it on board the space station. Astronaut can have a look, knows immediately how much radiation he gets. And that's actually a development since the environment in space is so harsh. 
if you build a detector for this environment, you can also use it on Earth, because in principle, it will cover everything you want to know on Earth as well. So that's one of the developments which occur in the Dana, which will hopefully also fly uh, for exploration missions. The problem is with radiation and with the radiation risk, these personal dose meters, you put them on the skin. So it measures the radiation on the skin. The problem is our organs have a different sensitivity to radiation. So your skin can get much more radiation than your blood forming organs or your testes, etc. So that means in principle, if you want to determine a risk, you need to measure inside your organs. So in principle, you need an astronaut to either swallow a radiation detector or drill holes in an astronaut. <laughs> Actually, there were ideas, but it's uh, not really working. Yeah? <laughs> Swallowing worked at the beginning for cancer therapy. They just gave him to swallow them, and then they had to collect them afterwards, which is a little bit. But it worked. It worked. So what you do, you need something else. You need something which is a human, but not really human, but it looks like a human. So, what you can do is you use so-called anthropomorphic phantoms. So that's in principle a human female, average size, kind of, um, which, is, which you can in principle uh, put together, remove, and you can put radiation detector in there. And if you can put radiation detector in the phantom, you can measure at the organ locations. Straightforward approach. Um, <coughs> That was done already uh, on board the space station, and that's actually not a, a female one, but a male phantom, but it's the same idea. You have this phantom, it's real human bones, so it's actually used also in radiotherapy, and you stuff it with radiation detectors, and then you send it up to space in various locations, so performing an EVA, being in the Russian module, being in the, in the Japanese uh, Kibo module, and then you collect all these detectors, and I hope the next movie works. So that's actually, can you click on the movie? Yeah, that's actually uh, John Williams, 10 years ago almost, collecting all these radiation detectors, which were in the brain uh, of the phantom. So you have to bring them back, but in principle, works out fine. And I think he was happy doing the job, hopefully. Um, so what you get at the end is, and also this is a movie, if we can click. What you get is in principle something like a nice 3D graph of how much radiation you would receive when you are at certain parts of the space station or if you're outside the space station. And you can take this information, which is like a discrete information, only measurement points, uh, and put this in some way of three-dimensional distribution, then you can see what's the relevant radiation exposure if you are like Matroshka 1, that was an exposure outside the space station and in different parts of the space station. And now you have, in principle, the subset of data which you can use to look into the relevant organs and determine the dose in the organs, which you then can use for radiation risk estimations. So, now we have the tools, so that's something which you can use also for exploration missions. And if you want to go back to the moon, and actually that's a nice picture of really people on the moon, and that's uh, the closest we are currently uh, to the moon on the right part, that's a picture from Paolo Nespoli from on board the International Space Station, so he's closer to the moon than we are, but still quite far away. So, uh, as I said before, the radiation environment, if you go outside Earth, is much harsher than it is in low Earth's orbit. Uh, and I give you some numbers, you don't have to remember them, uh, but just to, just to see, the, at 50 meters, that's in Cologne, that's the cathedral in Cologne, if you fly in an airplane, your radiation exposure is already a factor of 40 higher than it is on ground, approximately. If you fly on board the space station, <coughs> the factor is 250. So, and we are still in low Earth orbit. And now we want to go for exploration missions. And fortunately, uh, we had the MSL rover, which was flying to Mars and also is measuring the radiation with the MSL rod instrument at the surface of Mars since 2012. So 
That's the data for flying to Mars. It's a factor of 770 or let's say 800 in free space compared to Earth. And at the surface of Mars, we are approximate at the same dose levels that we, that we have on board the space station. So flying there gives you much more radiation than being on Earth or being on board the space station. So you have to tackle these problems. And if you take into account, and that's a, a sketch which I got from my colleagues from Lockheed Martin, one of the possible concepts uh, for the Deep Space Gateway, which will happen, which is going to happen in the, uh, the thing which is going to happen in the next two years is the Orion missions. So first we have the Orion Exploration 1 mission, that's the EM-1 mission, which will fly in 2019, in two years time, uh, in cislunar orbit, and it's unmanned. So that means if it's unmanned, there is enough place for doing science because we can use all the not, well, we can use all the seats which are unoccupied to put some experiments there. And <coughs> we had a discussion with the colleagues uh, from Lockheed Martin. We're developing the Orion mission and then I said, okay, uh, let's find an idea. What can we do? What would be the best thing uh, in working to protecting the astronauts and gaining good science uh, out of the Orion EM-1 mission. Uh, and we proposed the Matroshka asteroid experiment. And Matroshka is, was the name of the Phantom which we used before. Matroshka, due to the fact that this was this Russian puppets in the puppets, you can make it, remove them. So when you remove it, put the detectors out of the stuff. And a little bit of background for the EM-1 mission. So it's the unmanned flight planned for 2019. It's the first Orion flight beyond Earth to a cislunar space between 25 and 42 days, so it's quite a long mission. Um, there are several other science payloads, some CubeSats um, on the LS LSL upper stage. And <coughs> sorry, inside the Orion cabin, we will have the MARI experiment, um, which is a science payload which was proposed by the Israeli Space Agency and by uh, the German Aerospace Center. And the aim is that we'll fly two of these female phantoms on two of the seats. Uh, seat number three and four in the Orion mission. And one of them will have a dedicated radiation shielding vest, which is designed by our colleagues from Stemrad. And by doing, having two experiments, one with a shielding vest, the other one without, we can determine how good the possible new technologies for radiation shielding are for the exploration missions. And uh, this uh, proposal was sent in and it was accepted by NASA and manifested for the flight in May. Uh, this year. So in principle, it, it will look like this. You have a female torso, and this female torso will be mounted like sitting, sit, well, sitting in Orion means you lay down in, for, for the launch. So it sits, lay down uh, uh, on one of the seats, and then one of the phantoms will wear this nice uh, so-called asteroid radiation vest, which should shield uh, against the radiation. So. In principle, what we're aiming to do with this experiment is we use a phantom, so that means we stuff it with radiation detectors, international-wise, so from a lot of different communities, and new, developed, new developments for this. Uh, we measure the radiation. We can use this to refine the risk projections for these long-duration uh, missions. And it also helps to validate the protection provided by, this, by the asteroid the radiation vest. And the team includes colleagues from Lockheed Martin, who are co-located with the Orion program uh, for the efficient payload integration and also for spacecraft shielding analysis. So even if you start working on a spacecraft, you already take into account where it has to go, like to Moon, to Mars. You take the environment into account, which you will encounter. So that also means you design it already in the best way possible to mitigate all possible effects you could have, so, which means radiation, microgravity, et cetera, et cetera. And, and this is actually a very nice opportunity for an international endeavor uh, for this radiation protection for exploration. And international, uh, that's something we always want to emphasize. All the science we do in space and all the science which is done for exploration mission is all done on international level. So it's not this agency alone or this agency alone. It's always like 
taking the best brains which are available and put them together uh, and see what you can come up with this. Uh, and I just want to thank our, all my colleagues here from Lockheed Martin and from Stemrat uh, for working on this. Um, a summary, and I think I'm perfectly in time. Uh, so a short summary is space is a harsh environment and it's even harsher for exploration. Uh, the radiation and the radiation load in humans are with the in influence of the microgravity environment and also all the psychological issues, the main concerns for these exploration missions. And that's a big thing, a big question mark, which still has to be solved before we really send humans to Mars. There are technologies which are under development or which will be developed for this mission to determine these relevant conditions. This phantoms, as I said before, is a perfect tool. And uh, since, as I, as I also mentioned, the EM-1 mission is empty, we can use the EM-1 uh, for this experiment. Hopefully also for Orion EM-2, uh, be able to do similar uh, things. And the new technologies uh, shall enable a safer travel in space. And these new technologies are not developed by agencies, but that's a private company. And at the end, I want to say the future is wide open and I'm pretty sure we will fly to Mars. I'm not really sure if I'm still working. I'm already retired when we are there. Uh, but also for a scientist, it's an extremely interesting time because 10 years ago, everybody was happy when we were just flying something to the International Space Station. And now the International Space Station is just like the starting point for exploration. And will it be cislunar orbit going further, going to Mars? And for a scientist doing stuff which can fly to Mars or to Moon, it's wonderful. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, we're almost ready for lunch. No? Thank you, Thomas. Thank you.